Hello class, Mr. Fino here. This is unit six, lesson four on the first emperor of China. I really like this picture um, of the Great Wall because the sunset or whatever is going on in the sky is really cool. So in this section, you will learn about the first emperor of China, Qin Shi Wang Di. What a handsome man. All right. So our first question is, how did Qin Shi Wang Di come to power? So um, before he was Qin Shi Wang Di, he was Prince Zheng uh, of the uh, Qin dynasty. And he came to power at the age of 13. After the Qin dynasty seized power um, from the, you know, after the Warring States period. Um, he was known as the Tiger of Qin. Um, he used his military might, bribes, spies, and alliances to take control of all of China. And in 221 BCE, he named himself Qin Shi Wang Di, which means the first emperor Qin. So that's literally what it means, the first emperor Qin. This boy is not 13. It's just he was a boy when he became uh, king or whatever, when he came to power. All right, so next we're looking at Qin Shi Wang Di and legalism. So the emperor was greatly influenced by legalism, which means he believed in strict laws, harsh punishment, harsh punishment, punishments, and a strong central authority. So that's a, you know what legalism is all about: you know, strict laws, harsh punishments, and a strong central authority. Meaning, the government kind of controls everything. And uh, Qin Shi Huangdi got rid of the system of feudalism that was used before, where the king divvied up land and gave it to lords and had them control plots of land. He didn't want to do that. He established a government he could control personally. He wanted total control. Um, so a little bit more about Qin, Qin Shi Huangdi and legalism. He put three people in each of the 36 Chinese territories. So China was divided up into 36 territories, and he put three people in each of them to rule over them. So one official ruled the army. One official ruled over laws and agriculture, and one official kept the uh, emperor well informed. He was kind of like an informant. He was probably like a spy of sorts that could tell the emperor what was going on um, in his uh, in his uh, territories. And when he discovered plots to end his life, and there were this happened because he wasn't very popular with some people. He executed the traitors and their families. And he was so extreme with trying to you know, defend his right to the throne. He even exiled his own mother, fearing she was plotting against him. Uh, so how did Qin Shi Huangdi standardize trade? Remember, the word standardize means to make the same. So how did he make it the same throughout the empire um, to make things more efficient? So the emperor standardized money, weights, and measures. Um, so, so first, the emperor required everyone to use go coins of gold and bronze. So before um, he required this, you know, they trade lots of different things, shells, um, different types of metal, you know, but he wanted everyone to exchange the same money throughout the entire empire. So coins of gold and bronze. And coins, like the one seen here on the left, had a hole in the center, so they could be held on a cord. It just made, made things more um, convenient, right? And then measuring cups were made by metal workers to hold consistent amounts. Um, so just it was the same throughout the empire. All right, next question. How did Qin Shi Huangdi protect China from invaders? So Qin Shi Huangdi forced laborers, right, forced to build a massive wall on China's northern border. So you can see here in the map, um, you can see this is kind of along China's northern border, right? Um, and also previous kingdoms had already built small walls. So what the emperor did was, you know, in addition to building new parts, he had his laborers connect them. 
right? So it became kind of this longer, continuous wall, right? You can see here. Um, the, so over time, the complete structure eventually became known as the Great Wall. And what's important to note is the Great Wall of the Qin Dynasty was much simpler than what we see today. A lot of the Great Wall that we see in pictures and stuff today was built later on. Even in the last 500 years, later dynasties built more complex, complex structures. Um, so you'd see stuff like this, mounds of earth stacked up with, with uh, wood. And, you know, the main purpose of the wall was just to make it difficult for the invaders from the north so that they couldn't bring sheep or cattle, right, or um, bring their materials in, their weapons and, and that sort of thing. Uh, their um, resources, and also so their horses could not jump over it. That just made it, you know, if they had to stop, get off their horses and climb over themselves, then, you know, that they were at a huge disadvantage. So what were the conditions like building the Great Wall? Well, to be honest, they weren't great. So the workforce of 300,000 consisted of soldiers, peasant farmers, and those in exile. So... People like musicians, teachers, writers, and artists that the emperor disagreed with their beliefs. Um, they were exiled, and then he'd have them work on the Great Wall and other labor, uh, working projects. Uh, the Great Wall crossed high mountains, deserts, swampland, and quicksand. So you can see, you know, in the topography of, of China, it's a varied landscape, right? There's flatlands, there's mountains, there's deserts. So if they're doing this for a stretch, building this wall, they're going to have to do it on a lot of different types of land. So uh, you'd see weather that was very um, diverse, right? So very cold winters and very hot summers that made it miserable for the people building it. Um, tens of thousands of men died and their bodies were buried in the wall. It was just simple. You just bury it in the wall where they're building and you don't need to worry about the bodies. Um, uh, supply camps brought food and materials to workers in the mountains and deserts, right? They needed materials, right? They needed food. So they organized that. And then soldiers were posted to fight off bandits. That's a good thing. Bandits, because they're, if they're in the northern frontier, you're going to see these, these enemies, right? So that's good, soldiers to protect them. But soldiers were also there to prevent workers from leaving. So uh, this picture kind of shows how harsh the labor was and the fact that at least tens of thousands of men died. It's pretty extreme. So how did Qin Shi Huangdi hold on to power? So, um, as far as we know, he executed 460 Confucian scholars that plotted against him. This is the symbol for Confucianism. Because these scholars, they believe proper behavior and setting a good example were more important than harsh laws. But Shi Huangdi didn't like that. Right? He was all about legalism. He was about strict laws. He didn't care about Confucianism. And eventually, at, there was, at a royal banquet, a Confucian uh, scholar criticized the emperor. And um, one of Ch uh, Qin Shi Huangdi's advisor, advisors, advisors, sorry, advisors was there. And he went back and talked to the emperor and said, you know, we got to get rid of uh, Confucianism in, in, the emperor, in the empire. So from there on, Qin Shi Huangdi declared that nobody could learn about Confucianism. Um, all Confucian books were to be burned. So only books on medicine, farming, and Qin history could remain in the empire. Scholars that refused to obey were, well, so here's a picture of one of these scenes where you, so you can see here books are burning, right? Confucian books. And then there's also an event where it is said Confucian scholars that opposed this book burning were buried alive. So you can see them being thrown into this pit. Um, so again, scholars that refused to obey were given a face tattoo and sent to do forced labor, maybe like on the Great Wall. I don't know if their tattoos look like this, but it marked them, right? So they were seeing it. So when people saw them out, they knew, oh, this is a Confucian scholar. And again, here's another extreme example of how crazy Qin Shi Huangdi was with his power. When his son questioned the killing of the scholars here, 
he was sent he was sent to work on the Great Wall. So just shows you how crazy Qin Shi Huangdi was about his power. So how did the rule of Qin Shi Huangdi end? So it is believed that the emperor was a very unhappy person in general, and he was afraid of death. So he sought out magicians and potions uh, in an effort to become immortal, right, to live forever. And on one such journey, 600 miles from the capital city, I think he was in the islands, you know, east of China, he died. Uh, some believe that he was poisoned, which would make sense considering he was so un unpopular with many people. Um, so all in all, Qin Shi Huangdi only ruled the Qin Dynasty for 10 years, and then his reign ended. And the, so the Qin Dynasty did not last for very long at all. Um, the burial of Qin Shi Huangdi. So he was buried in a massive, miles-long tomb that was built by 700,000 workers. Um, so here is a picture to show the scale of some of the burial stuff. And I'll talk about this in a second. And uh, some of the workers were even buried with the emperor because they didn't want information to get out to grave robbers about, you know, the treasures within the tomb. So rather than let the pe the workers out to their lives and potentially leak information, they just killed them and buried them with him. So here's a rendering on the right, what it looked, probably looked like above ground and then on the left below ground. Um, so in 1974, uh, that's when they discovered his tomb. And in that discovery, tools, precious jewels, and rare objects were found. The most amazing of the discoveries was the terracotta army, which was seen in the picture before you for scale, right? There's, you see all the, um, these are clay life-sized, um, figures, but, um, so it consists of 6,000 life-size figures of archers, right? With bows and arrows, foot soldiers, chariot drivers, and horses. And every single figure inside of this terracotta army was unique. No two uh, figures were exactly the same. So it just shows the time and effort they put into making this army for Ch Qin Shi Huangdi in his afterlife. All right, so what happened after the death of Qin Shi Huangdi? So uh, rebellion broke out across the countryside. Um, so that'd be like farmers and peasants. And eventually even members of the royal families joined in the revolt to try to overthrow the Qin, the Qin dynasty. Um, because, you know, Qin Shi Huangdi was dead and there was no leader to kind of take his place. So civil war raged for about five years until Liu Bang, a peasant leader, gained power and established the Han Dynasty. That's Liu Bang. All right, so in conclusion, in this lesson, we learned about the first emperor of China, Shi Wang Di. All right, 